Today we're just doing a live. This is a live setting. It's a little less um, formatted. We're just going to talk to you a little bit about a couple scriptures. Just real quick, we're going to talk to you about Deacon Stephen. Because I want to know if what Deacon Stephen went through, I want to know if it was worth it. And we're going to start with Acts chapter 11, verse 18. You won't even need your Bible today because we're going to run it through the bottom of the screen for you. If you look down below, you'll see Acts eleven eighteen says, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God also, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Did God really grant repentance to the Gentiles? So Acts 11 is about a deacon named Stephen. Stephen was the guy, you'll see in Acts 7, 59, Stephen was the guy that they killed. How did they kill him? They literally picked up rocks and they stoned him to death. Mm -hmm. If I was Stephen, I would have been taking some of those same rocks and I'd have been throwing them right back at him. I don't know why or where it's written that you can't defend yourself, that you can't duck, dodge, run. I don't know why he stood there, but that's, that's what happened. Uh, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my sight. They stoned Stephen for preaching. What did they stone Stephen, 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 for preaching against them? Did they kill him because they didn't like what he said? Or did they kill him because he was just preaching? So let's let's find out where Stephen came from. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we see the whole purpose of a deacon. We see where the church created the deacon. Uh, the purpose of a deacon was so that you can take care of the things in the church, especially it was created because of the widows in the church. Does your church take care of the widows? Are the widows in your church taken care of by the church, right. by the deacons? Acts 6, 1, in those days when a number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. See that? The widows were neglected. The widows were neglected. The widows were neglected. The women that didn't have a husband were neglected. Why didn't they just marry again? Then they wouldn't be a widow anymore. That's another lesson. So since the widows were neglected, they, the disciples figured we have to do something about this. We have things to do. We can't stop and take care of the uh, widows. So we're going to do something about that. In Acts chapter 6, verse 3, it says, because of this situation, that's what wherefore means, brethren, Go and look for seven men of honest report because it matters what other people think about you. Sometimes it does. It doesn't matter how you live your life if you're living your life in an evil way because everybody who's also evil will appreciate you. It's amazing how when you want to smoke, it's amazing how generous people are. Everybody will go on your cigarette. They'll give you a light. When you're drinking, everybody's generous with their drinks. When you don't want to drink, they make you feel bad. Everybody will offer you something to drink. Everybody offers you some weed. Isn't that amazing? But if they had a nice burger, a nice number one Chick-fil-A sandwich, they don't want to offer you that. It's amazing how that works. They wanted somebody who had an honest report. I don't have time to interview and check this person out. Does everybody else say this person is saved and living holy and doing the right things? If everybody else is saying that he not, then we don't have time for that. Full of. The key word here in Acts uh, chapter 6, verse 3 is full of the Holy Ghost. Why didn't it just say has the Holy Ghost? Is there a difference in being full of the Holy Ghost? All right. And wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Here comes now the appointing of the deacon, the first deacon of the church. This is the purpose of a deacon. Does your church deacons do this business? Why does it say full of the Holy Ghost? Verse number four, Acts 6, 3, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. This is what the apostles are saying. We need a deacon to take care of the widows so that we can continually preach. Nope. It says pray. That's what a real minister does. That's what a real preacher does. That's what a real pastor does. That's what a real bishop does. Continually pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And they have to lead the example of praying continually and to the ministry of the word. The purpose of the deacon is so that preachers can pray. Got that? 
and so the widows can be taken care of. Acts 6, verse 8. Here we're going to find that Stephen, Stephen, sorry, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, verse 8 says, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So he has the Holy Ghost. He has faith. He has wisdom. He has power. He can work miracles. Do you have faith? Wisdom. Power that works miracles? You have the Holy Ghost, right? Does your Holy Ghost work miracles? How do you know the Holy Ghost is supposed to bring you power? How do you know the Holy Ghost is supposed to bring you power to work miracles? Let's go to Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. This is the Holy Ghost. But ye tarry in the city of Jerusalem, this happened in the day of Pentecost, until you be endued with the Holy Ghost. No, until you be endued with power. The Holy Ghost is power. Power from on high. You have the Holy Ghost, but do you have power? Do you have power to separate yourself from sin? Do you have power to separate yourself from your proclivities? Do you have power to stop doing the things that you know is contrary to the Word of God? Do you have power to overcome temptation? Or are you always falling back into temptation? Are you still picking up the phone and calling him? Are you still going to places that you have no business going? If you have power, why is this a struggle for you? Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says the same thing. But you shall receive power. When? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Here we go again. I'm proving that the Holy Ghost is power. Now, if you keep reading that, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. What? You shall be witnesses unto me. You shall be. Not that I would like for you to be. When you get the Holy Ghost, you should be a witness. You should be desiring to tell everybody about this new person that just stepped into your body. How did you get filled with all of this power? How are you working miracles? How do you have so much faith? How do you have all of this and don't tell anybody? Who in the church right now? Who in the body of Christ right now? Who is saved right now because of you? Who did you talk to? Who did you witness to? Who did you give your testimony to? And they can say it was because of me that they're in the church, that I'm in the church now. You're supposed to be, you shall be a witness. What's your witness? Somebody be able to look at you and say, you have changed. I remember when you used to cuss. I remember when you used to lie. I remember when you used to do this and that. Even the way you dress, your appearance, your demeanor, everything about you just suddenly changed. What happened to you? Somebody filled with the Holy Ghost can't wait till somebody asks me. Because I can tell you right now, this, this is awesome. This thing that I have is God Almighty walking inside of me. Now, Stephen had all of this power, but he was still murdered. He was still a martyr. Would you die for the gospel? Would you die so that somebody else can be saved? Do you believe in the truth so much? Do you believe that this truth is right to the point that you're willing to die for it? You don't have to die for it. You don't have to be a martyr. But do you believe it enough that you're willing to die for it? Tell me why they killed Stephen. Why did they kill him? They captured him and they brought him before the high priest. And when they gave him a chance to speak, the first thing he did is open his mouth and start preaching. He started preaching about what Abraham said. And you'll see that in Acts 7, verse 6. He began preaching about what God said to Abraham. So we skip down to save some time, and you'll see Acts 7, verse 6 says, And God spake on this wise, that his seed, whose seed? Abraham. Abraham's offspring are Abraham's children, should sojourn in a strange land. They're going to be taken to a strange land, Abraham's children, and that they should bring them into bondage, slavery, and they shall entreat them evil for 400 years. Before you say this is Egypt, go back and check, and you tell me how long they were in Egypt and how long they were in slavery. You'll never come up with 400 years. This verse here requires them to be in slavery, being treated evil for the entire 400 years. Abraham's children, slavery, 400 years. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible requires. The people that they, the people that the Bible is talking about would have to have lived this. It has to be in their ancestors. Their ancestors would have to have lived 400 years to be Abraham's seed. 
being in slavery, treated evil that did not happen in Egypt. Verse 7, and the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, God is going to judge them. Who said it? God said it. And after that, they're going to come out of that place and they're going to serve me in this place. What place? In Jerusalem. If you skip down to Acts 7, verse 52, it says, which of the prophets have not yet, have not your fathers persecuted? This is Stephen preaching. I'm showing you why they're getting mad at him to the point where they have to kill him and even worse. And they have slain them, which was showed before the coming of the just one. So this is the Bible is telling, this is Stephen talking about the scriptures in the Old Testament when God sent prophets and his own people killed the prophets. They didn't listen to him. They stopped their ears. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. So now Stephen is accusing them of killing Jesus. <clears throat> Acts 7.53 says, who have yet, I'm sorry, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels, what, the law, the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. He's accusing the people before him for not keeping the law. I thought we don't have to keep the law. If you go down to verse 54, Acts 7, verse 54 says, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart and they gnashed on it with their teeth. If you are a preacher and you're preaching and people run up to you and bite you, that's when you know you reached them. When they get so mad when they can't stand it to where it cuts their heart. When you preach until it cuts their heart and now they're running to you to bite you, why didn't God intervene? Why did God allow Stephen to be destroyed? Why did God allow Stephen to be bitten and then stoned? Maybe it's not about Stephen. Maybe what you're going through is not about you. Maybe what's happening to you is not about you. It has nothing to do with you. Is that okay? Are you willing to die for this gospel? Are you willing to die for this truth? Are you willing to go through anything at all? Anything that might make you uncomfortable? Anything that might make you move from out of your comfort zone? Is it worth it? Was what Stephen went through worth it? Was what he had to deal with? Is somebody biting you on your side? Is it worth it for somebody else to be saved? What Stephen went through caused two-thirds of the Bible to be written, two-thirds of the New Testament to be written. You know how? It was necessary for what Stephen went through for Apostle Paul to write two-thirds of the Bible. Okay? Acts 7, verse 58 says, this is after they bit him, they cast him out of the city. They put him out, and then they stoned him. And the witness, there was a witness, who laid their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. You see that? Be careful, your sins are finding you out. You see what he's doing? He's got caught being a part of this. He consented to it. Let's go to Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, was consenting unto his death. Yes, he had something to do with it. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad. I want you to remember that. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation of him. That means they cried. In verse 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. You see what he did? Right away. First he's at his feet. First he's there. And right away, Saul just, just something just happened. And all of a sudden, he made havoc of the church. In verse 3, entering into every house. When the Bible says every, it means every house. He went door to door, dragging men out, committing them to prison. Verse 4 says, therefore, they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. I want you to remember I said scattered, and I want you to think about preaching the word. Because here we have people running because they know Saul is coming. And it's not him by himself. He has an entourage. He has a bunch of people with him. And they're dragging people out of their house. He's, they're locking them up and killing them. So everybody runs. This is what Stephen had to die for. So that this can happen. So that the gospel could be spread abroad, spread abroad all over the world. Got it? Was it worth it? The people in the next city and the next city, for them to hear the gospel, was it worth it? Was it worth you going through this horrible thing that you're going through for the gospel's sake? Acts chapter 11, verse 24. We want to talk about uh, Barabbas. This is um, earlier in the chapter. I'm just trying to skip some time. We're going to go down to verse 24, where it says, For he, Barabbas, was a good man 
And here's that word again, full. Why did the Bible describe full of the Holy Ghost? Why didn't it just say he has the Holy Ghost? Full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. You see what happens when you get the Holy Ghost? The same thing that happened when Stephen got the Holy Ghost. And much people was added unto the Lord. This is a good thing. It's a good thing when people are added unto the Lord. But why does the Bible say full of the Holy Ghost? Peter preached in Acts chapter 11. What did he preach about? He preached about when God told him to slay and eat. Some people think that means that the Bible is now contradicting itself, saying that you can go eat pork, which is against the law. Okay? But people think that's what it means. All right. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, the people that uh, Peter was preaching to, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God had also, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. You see that? They were scattered because of what happened to Stephen. They traveled and they showed you how far they traveled. Phenis, Cyprus, Antioch. Who were they preaching to? Preaching the word to none but unto the Jews. So we have Peter preaching earlier. And, and we hear in, back, in verse number 18, it says, then God had also to the Gentiles granted repentance. But when you skip down to verse 19, it tells you he was only preaching to the Jews. When were they scattered? Let's go back to Acts 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Acts chapter 8 is when they were scattered. Let's go back to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. It tells you they were preaching the word to none but the Jews only. If Acts 11 says they're preaching to the Jews only, the ones that were scattered, in, in Acts chapter 8, then who could the people in Acts chapter 8 be preaching to? To the Jews only. Only makes sense. Acts chapter 19. Now they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Venice and Cyprus and to Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. Who was preaching the word? Those that were scattered. They saw what happened. They saw Apostle, well, he wasn't Apostle Paul yet, but they saw Saul coming to capture them, put them in jail, and do all manner of evil to them. So they took off. And what did they do? They were witnesses. They were still preaching. People get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what God expects you to do. Go tell somebody. Go bring somebody. Send this video to somebody. Bring somebody to church. Do whatever you have to do, but go and do something that, so that somebody in the kingdom is there because of you. But you also have to live a good life so that they can choose you and say that you have a good report. You have to live a good life so that everybody can see God in you. That's number one. Number two, why are these people always considered full of the Holy Ghost? Some people get a little touch. They, got, they get a little God move on them. They get a little goosebumps and their hair stand up. They think that's the Holy Ghost. Some people might even stammer and they think that's the Holy Ghost. But what you need is to be full, full of the Holy Ghost. You can't get a little bit of God. And we know that the Holy Ghost is Jesus, God himself. You can't get a little bit of him. You either get the Holy Ghost or you don't. God can touch you. He can move on you. He can talk to you. He can usher you into his presence. He can do a lot of things. But there's a total difference when God steps into your body and takes up residence there. Then you get power. Then you get faith. Then you become a witness. What will it take for you to go back and get full of the Holy Ghost? I know you got the Holy Ghost. I know. I know. I know. What would it take for you to get full of the Holy Ghost? What would it take for you to reduce your pride? Humble yourself. Get down before God and say, God, give me something. Something new. Talk to me one more time. Let me feel you all over again. You know what it'll take? It'll take you to repent from the stuff that you did from the time that you got saved from the time that you got baptized in Jesus' name. It would take you to start repenting all over again for the stuff that you've done since then. Have you lied? Have you have you cheated? Have you drank? Did, I don't know what you did. You know. You know what laws you broke. Have you been just unkind? Have you had malice in your heart, jealousy in your heart? What have you done? What have you done? What have you done that God has not forgiven you for yet? Is it okay to carry that into the grave? What have you done that God hasn't forgiven you for yet? Why not get forgiveness for it? Why not ask him now? Why not beg him now? What will it take for you to pray and talk to God? What does God have to send for you to stop and say, okay, God, what has to happen? 
You know what has to happen? Maybe God has to send some calamity your way. I don't want that. So I'm here to just ask you, to plead with you. Go talk to God. Pray. Beg him to forgive you for everything that you've done in your life. Everything that you've done this week. Everything that you've done in 2022. Every ungodly thought. Every ungodly action. What will it take for God to listen and believe you? Will he believe you this time? When you ask him to forgive you? Are you serious? Or do you mean it when you tell him I'll never sin again? Every time God forgave somebody, what did he say to them? Did he say, okay, go and don't do that anymore? Or did he say, go and sin no more? Because that's what he requires. He requires you to sin no more. Can you make up in your mind today that you will never sin again? You don't want to do anything that will displease God. Can you decide that in your mind? God, I want to live holy starting now. Why don't you do that now? Why don't you do that now? Why don't you just close your eyes? I'm talking to all of you. Why don't you just close your eyes and beg God to forgive you? You already know what you did. And it's the first thing that came to your head. See how God is helping you? He's working with you. First thing that came to your head, that's the thing that you need to get forgiveness for. Now, how do you convince him to forgive you for that? Because there's there's a place for people who are, have not been forgiven. And you're so special that the God, God has sent his word to you, specifically to you. People are scattered all over the world, and you just so happen to come upon this YouTube channel. Somehow, you clicked on this YouTube channel, you're here. Why not just repent and tell, ask God to forgive you for that thing that just popped up in your mind? Did God forgive you for it? Don't go to bed tonight until he forgives you for it. Thank you all for coming. We're back here on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Go ahead and subscribe and turn on the bell notifications so that you can get all of our videos. Go through it. Click the video button and go through all of our videos. Take your time. Go ahead and write, comment, whatever you think. What scriptures do you think? What do you think about these scriptures? And let us know. Till Wednesday at 7 p.m. See you.